David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, August 5th, 2022. Time for the end of another week. And uh, we do that and we mark it with another show, of course. That's the way we mark time. Ticking them off one at a time. Fifth day of the week this week. And, uh, yeah, let's see. Mm-hmm. Uh, we started this week uh, on, an, like, an even number. Well... No, actually an odd number, but I mean uh, a roundish number, even though it's the least round number there is. One, August 1st, so I mean, five days down in August. It's a relative, uh, I don't know, it's not exactly a rarity, but it's one of those uh, great things for the, uh, the, I don't know, the OCD obsessed, I guess, to start the first on a Monday and to be able to count your days off that way, it's so much easier. And so rarely do we ever have to count the days off. It hardly even makes any sort of difference. But today's the counting kind of day. Apparently it's Jobs Friday. Time to put out the the calculation of how many jobs were added in the last month, etc., etc. And apparently that's ex- really exciting to even uh, political people who I can usually keep tabs on and understand exactly why they're excited about things, you know, Knowing how many jobs were created is a good thing, uh, but some people get, like, super excited about it because it's, uh, you know, one of those leading political indicators, and uh, you can make predictions about how elections might or might not go because, as everybody knows, it's the economy, stupid, etc., etc., and so uh, that, I don't know, all right, well, that gets people, I think, irrationally excited, and uh, this time, once again, more good news happening here. So that's nice to know. I just happened to see, uh, let's see, Armando was jumping into the conversation about it. And uh, I have seen Bill, Bill in Portland, Maine. If you've been wondering what he's been up to in the mornings, he's tweeting about it this morning or this and a combination of things. Where was the, um, yeah, now I can't find Armando's particular uh, comment about it. But somebody had just, uh, I, I wanted to look his up. Dang, why is his not uh, instantly visible to me? But he was uh, uh, commenting on someone else's summation of what had been going on. And I guess it was that Republicans had been, of course, on television, spending their day there, sending their economists, such as they are, out and saying, well, obviously this is going to be terrible, that there was a preliminary... um, uh, indication or their preliminary estimates were that uh, Democrats were saying uh, some 250,000 jobs might be created in the past report. I don't even know what the, the term of the reports are. Um, but that uh, these Republicans were there to tell you that, no, this was obviously a wild overestimation of things. And they'd be there it is, I think. is Is this the one? That, uh, yeah, uh, Eric Cleefield was tweeting this around and, and Armando had uh, commented on it. This from Fox Business yesterday, former Trump economic advisors Larry Kudlow and Kevin Hassett dismissed Wall Street expectations of a 250,000, 250K jobs report for July, insisting in this recession which they insist is on and no one else agrees, it would be closer to 100, way on the downside. So there's your recession for you. Only 100,000 jobs created during this terrible recession was their prediction, not the 250,000 that were being predicted by Wall Street. But guess what? The numbers just came out and apparently, well, the official numbers and always subject to revision, these things change a lot. But the official numbers at the moment are 528,000 jobs created. So, of course, in this recession, it was only going to be 100,000. It's five times as much. And as you can see, um, the United States is a hellhole. And that's what Bill was talking about this morning. We've been missing Bill's morning tweets these days, taking the summer off, taking the rest of his life off. I don't know. I suppose 
Uh, you want to shed your various responsibilities. And I guess it was starting to feel like maybe it was, ah, you know, if it gets to be a chore, you know, that's okay. But anyway, what is he tweeting about this morning? There's something, always something going on. This relevant to this morning's discussion. So I grabbed it. Republicans are going to be furious. He says 50 days of lower gas prices, a major climate and health care bill poised to pass. Uh, the then current head again of Al Qaeda, Al Zawiri, has been killed. And of course, now this a holy hell that's good for the country, right? So here you go. Jobs being created, gas prices coming down, a big climate and health care bill ready to pass via reconciliation, no less. Uh, top Al Qaeda leader killed and jobs on the, in the offing. So, you know, once again, America, pretty much a hellhole. That's going to be the Republican theme on these things. And they are, I guess, having to spend some time thinking about how to react to all this. I don't I didn't know where this would lead us. But now that I think about it, there was that uh, now there's more on a theme. The New York Times, uh, Jonathan Weissman tweeting around. His own article, which he uh, shares credit for with Katie Gluick, if I've got that pronunciation correct. They're reporting on uh, mo more about the, the fallout from Kansas. Republicans begin adjusting to a fierce abortion backlash. The subheader reads this way. After Kansans voted to preserve abortion access, Republicans who once said the economy reigns supreme are acknowledging the issue will be a centerpiece in the fall campaigns. Yeah, well, you just got clobbered. And maybe that was uh, maybe one of the more mm, strategically valid reasons for the Republican legislature there in Canada, Canada, Kansas. Sorry, Canada. I've been thinking about Canada lately. Like, where to go if Ron DeSantis takes over? But um, they've been uh, thinking about the reality of uh, what happened there and trying to recalibrate and uh, figure out how to deal with the fact that they've been handed this tremendous loss. But maybe it was one of the more strategically uh, valid reasons for the Republican legislature in Kansas to have uh, pushed the question into the primary ballot here in July, which was, you know, a little bit of a dirty trick, really. And they, I'm sure they really thought the main topic uh, of conversation then was probably to uh, take advantage of a low turnout situation. And they thought win the referendum and they did not. But I wonder whether they also gave any thought to the um, to the possibility that this would give them an early preview of how the issue was really playing. I don't know when they made the decision to put the referendum there, but it must have been fairly recently, post-Dobbs, I would assume. And uh, it may turn out to be strategically helpful for them just so that they know going into November what they're really facing in terms of backlash. I mean, I hope they blow it, but it might be... I wonder whether that ever came into the discussion when they were making this decision. And I want to note, just to reiterate, as we did yesterday, what were we reading about yesterday that was similar, just in terms of moving the vote up earlier? Uh, I need to like remind myself, and I might have to go back to the pocket archives to see if I can figure that one out. Well, what was that? Now I can't even remember, and I'm looking around to see whether... Uh, any there's any indication of who did who yeah, now I can't remember well see if you remember from yesterday that's the quiz about yesterday's show what was it that in another state they put a question on the ballot early during a primary that uh, in the hopes that they might get a low turnout situation. I can't recall what it was now yesterday, but we definitely read something about it, and uh, that'll puzzle me for the rest of the show. In the meantime, while you're thinking about it, I'll read you this article from the Times about Republicans preparing to deal with this backlash. Republican candidates facing a stark reality check from Kansas voters are softening their once uncompromising stands against abortion, 
Isn't that interesting? As they move toward the general election, recognizing that strict bans are unpopular and that the issue may be a major driver in the fall campaigns. Remember that the candidate in a box instructions up until about five days ago was that people want strong, firm stances and they respect uh, clarity and you should just stand there and say no exceptions. They want to hear strong pro-life voices say no exceptions on abortion. And that's the that's the tough person's uh, principled stance and everyone should say that. And then you got some indication that that was clear to them that that wasn't really actually going to work when they started we started seeing people testifying before Congress saying things like, well, uh, uh, terminating a pregnancy in a, uh, in a very young girl who's been uh, raped or somebody who is suffering from an ectopic pregnancy, those would not be abortions. They're something else. They're kittens or apple pies, and everybody should have a couple of those, and uh, we're still totally, totally anti-abortion and no exceptions because of how strongly principled we are, except for the exceptions, which we'll just call something else, right? So they're already making that shift. In swing states and even conservative corners of the country, several Republicans have shifted their talk on abortion bans, newly emphasizing support for exceptions. Some have noticeably stopped discussing details at all. Pitched battles in Republican-dominated state legislatures have broken out now that the Supreme Court has made what has long been a theoretical argument, a reality. In Pennsylvania, Doug Mastriano, the Republican's ardently anti-abortion candidate for governor, has lately taken to saying the people of Pennsylvania will decide what abortion looks like in the state, not the governor. Hmm. Uh, for the guy who was, you know, maximalist on everything. He's decided that won't work. Uh, in Minnesota, Scott Jensen, a family physician who said in March that he would, quote, try to ban abortion as governor, said in a video released before the Kansas vote, before the Kansas vote, that he does support some exceptions. If I've been unclear previously, I want to be clear now. Uh-huh, sure. Republican consultants for Senate and House campaigns said Thursday that while they still believe inflation in the economy will drive voters to the GOP candidates, uh, oh, I'm sorry, will drive voters to the GOP, comma, candidates are going to have to talk about abortion to blunt Democratic attacks that the party's position is extreme. They have started advising Republicans to endorse bans that allow exceptions for pregnancies, of course, from rape or incest or those that threaten the life of the mother, like where we were years ago. And uh, they have spent the last 20 years saying, no, 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 we should get rid of those exceptions. Now that they've gotten rid of them, uh, it doesn't work out so well. Anyway, they've told candidates to emphasize care for women during and after their pregnancies, which they won't follow through with uh, in any way, shape or form, I can promise you. All right. If we were going to we are going to ban abortion, there are things we've got to do to make sure that the need for abortion is reduced and that women are not endangered, said Representative Nancy Mace, a Republican of South Carolina who won an exemption for rape and incest in her state's abortion law as a state representative. Now, she says, Republicans need to press to expand access to gynecological and obstetrics care, contraception, including emergency contraception, and even protect the right of women to leave their states to get an abortion without fear of prosecution. So she's a bit of an outlier on that. We'll see whether they, I guess she's won her primary, though, so there's no kicking her out for the next two years, uh, unless, of course, she loses the general election. So I guess uh, good. She should be saying these things. Messaging alone cannot free the GOP, and I'll say GOP because they actually put the periods in here. Uh, in the New York Times style. But messaging alone cannot free them from the drumbeat of news after the Supreme Court's decision, including the story of a 10-year-old rape victim who crossed state lines to receive an abortion and headlines about women who confronted serious health problems under new far-reaching restrictions or bans. On Thursday, Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, of course, has to insert himself into this, who has recently avoided talking about abortion, suspended a state attorney from Hillsborough County who refused to prosecute people who tried to provide abortions prohibited by the state's new 15-week ban, 
prompting angry recriminations from Democrats. Yeah, we might have to pause to add a little bit of news about that one. Uh, just because, once again, you know, Ron DeSantis going the, uh, you know, the fascist strongman route. Uh, well, you know, we're going to jump right to the next constitutional crisis by forcing out state's attorneys who may or may not be uh, under the governor's power to suspend or fire there in Florida. I don't know what the current state of the law is with respect to firing uh, state attorneys, but the new angle on that one whoops i got to get to my pocket list for that i happened to see ron filipkowski uh tweeting about this this morning of course it stirred some controversy when desantis did this uh, desantis tweeting about the subject in florida we will not allow the pathogen of ignoring the law to get a foothold in our state you take an oath to uphold all the laws of our state not just the ones you like otherwise find a new line of work which is of course ironic because ron desantis makes a daily practice of doing this and when he does it it's awesome and when other people do it it's a fireable offense but ron pointing out apparently that 15-week abortion ban has been struck down by a judge in Florida as violative of the Florida Constitution, which has an express right to privacy enshrined in it, unlike the federal Constitution. Uh, this uh, this state's attorney in question, I guess by the name of Warren, did they, meant, did they name him in the uh, New York Times story here? I don't think so, but by la last name of Warren, first name, unsure, but we'll read a little bit about him, I'm sure. But Warren, he says, Ron, is following the law in Florida as it stands today. It's DeSantis who's actually pressing for uh, the standard that's been overruled by a judge. DeSantis is trying to remove an elected official that they elected there, the state's attorneys for the county, uh, trying to remove an elected official for following current Florida law. So that's an interesting twist to this whole plot. Um, let's see. He's got a little bit more to say here about this before we jump back to the New York Times. Ron continues puzzling to try and figure out how a state attorney can be in violation of his oath for refusing to prosecute cases when not one of those cases has ever been presented to his office by law enforcement. And now the gutless cowards in the Florida GOP Senate will have to try and figure out a way to uphold a permanent removal of an elected official on a clearly unconstitutional order because they're so terrified of the bully with the bad haircut and ill-fitting suit. That is a good way of putting it. I think that's uh, a good summation of it. So there, uh, DeSantis jumping out and trying to pull a political stunt, no doubt at the urging of his communication staff that would like to do, uh, you know, the uh, take the... The crap, as as not as the kids would say, the uh, crap lord or crap posting uh, view of governance, and just jump out and insert yourself into a situation to do the knee jerk thing, because apparently there's a lot of support for knee jerk reaction to anything in Florida. So yes, they have a new 15 week abortion ban uh, supposedly on the books. This. Prosecutor says, well, I'm not going to prosecute anybody uh, under this law uh, because I believe it's unconstitutional under the Florida Constitution. I assume that was his reasoning. I'm not positive that that was his reasoning. Now, in the meantime, a judge actually says, that's right. It is unconstitutional under the Florida Constitution. And so you shouldn't prosecute anybody under this law. And they'll have their conviction overturned in my court anyway, if you do. And... DeSantis takes this situation and says, I won't stand for this theoretical thing of a separately elected state attorney upholding the current state of the law in Florida. He hasn't had a chance to not prosecute anybody yet, but so far he's just said, well, I'm going to listen to the courts and not prosecute anybody under this unconstitutional law. And DeSantis says, you're fired. And that's just because I'm so strict about applying the law. And we're not going to allow people to run around and give their own interpretation of the law unless it's me. I get to do it. That's pretty interesting. I know. It's just a side note, but an interesting one from this New York Times article. Now back to them. Um, 
after the DeSantis mention, the recalibration for some began before voters of deeply Republican Kansas voted overwhelmingly on Tuesday against removing abortion rights from the state's constitution. Since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, retracting the constitutional right to the procedure, many Republicans were slow to detail what would come next. As they rushed to enact long-promised laws, Republican-led legislatures have learned how difficult banning abortion can be. I'm going to add another aside here from something else, which I think is in pocket, but I, uh, I don't have it immediately at hand. But somebody made the excellent point of pointing out some of these states uh, passed, recently passed what they called trigger laws, things that would be, that were meant to take the place of Roe versus Wade should it be overturned. Uh, So a lot of states actually have given consideration to this, but of course they passed most of those laws in the belief that Roe would probably not be overturned so they got in many cases really super aggressive about it like you can if you can win points with the pro-life crowd by being maximalist by passing a law that is only going to go into effect if roe versus wade is overturned but as long as it's not you just get to pose as the toughest anti-abortion politician in the country and nothing will ever come of it. But then, poof, actually, it did get overturned. And now they're having to live with the consequences of these stupid trigger laws. And in a lot of states, they're having to backpedal from them. In other states, though, the stance was, well, if Roe versus Wade is overturned, uh, rather than passing a trigger law of something that will take effect, if they uh, sometimes passed resolutions just reaffirming that current laws or what was then current laws anti-abortion laws on their books, which they never removed in defiance of the Supreme Court in Roe versus Wade. They left whatever was on their books in 1973 alone. And in some cases, these are relatively, you know, I won't say ancient, but they're very old laws and have been on the books since, well, in some cases, what made the story interesting, in some cases, on the books since before women had the right to vote. So that poses a very interesting and different twist. Is it really reasonable to say that the law governing abortion should, in the absence of anything else, revert back to the law passed, you know, way back when, when we didn't really understand very much for one thing. And for another thing, women had no voice in that vote. That seems to, uh, that doesn't go over very well. Even with Republicans who are eliminating the right to vote left and right, uh, as a matter of course. All right. Once again, back to the New York Times. Get as much in before we can uh, at the before the end of this segment. The recalibration began, of course, for some before the Kansas earthquake, if you will. As they rush to enact long promised laws, Republican led legislatures have learned how difficult banning abortion can be. Not just the pro choice movement, but the pro life movement was caught by surprise by the Supreme Court, said Brandon Steele, a West Virginia delegate who pressed for an abortion ban without exceptions, of course, in a special session of the legislature that ended this week with the Republican supermajority stymied. We, without having the talking points, without being told what to do, because campaign in a box, legislators had to start saying what they were actually going to do. You could see the confusion in the room. Very interesting. We're finding out, I like this quote, and this is what uh, Jonathan Weissman was uh, tweeting around with the link to the article. We're finding out who is really pro-life and who is pro-life only to get elected, not just in West Virginia, but across the country, Mr. Steele said. Yes. And of course, it's interesting. The ones they consider to be really pro-life are the ones taking the position that all Republicans are hoping to abandon or at least add some nuance to so that they can survive their elections. In Indiana, a special session of the state legislature to consider a near total abortion ban has had brutal debates over whether to include exemptions and how far those exemptions should go. For some, it's very black and white. If you're pro-life, with no exceptions, or your pro-choice with no restrictions, said State Senator Kyle Walker, an Indiana Republican who said abortion should be legal during at least the first trimester of pregnancy. When you're in the gray area, you're forced to reconcile in your own mind 
where your own limits are. For months, Republicans have maintained that abortion rights would be a footnote in a midterm campaign driven by the worst inflation in 40 years, which is magically going away. Crime, immigration, and a Democratic president whose approval ratings are mired around 40%. That is still the public line, even after the Kansas referendum, where voters faced a single issue, not the multiplicity of factors that we'll be considering in November. But the reality on the campaign trail is different. Sarah Longwell, a Republican pollster, said in her focus groups that swing voters do bring up inflation in the economy when asked what issues are on their minds, but when prompted to discuss abortion, real passion flares. That indicates that if Democrats can prosecute a campaign to keep the issue front and center, they will find an audience, she said. Ms. Mace agreed, saying that abortion is rising fast and that Republicans have to respond. In Minnesota, Dr. Jensen, the Republican candidate expected to take on Governor Tim Waltz, suggested it was interactions with voters after the fall of Roe that he said prompted him to clarify his position on abortion. Once the Roe versus Wade decision was overturned, we told Minnesota and basically told everybody that we would engage in a conversation, he said. And during that conversation, I learned of the need for me to elaborate on my position. Ah, is that all? That elaboration included embracing a family and maternity leave program, promoting a $2,500 per child adoption tax credit and improving access to birth control, including providing oral contraceptives over the counter with a price ceiling. And like Adam Laxalt, the GOP, although as they say GOP, Senate nominee in Nevada, Dr. Jensen pointed to abortion protections already in place in Minnesota to cast the matter as settled <laughs> rather than on the ballot this year. Ah, they've been using that excuse for how long? It's settled law, it's settled law, it's settled law, said all of the conservative Republican uh, members of the Supreme Court who then voted to unsettle that law. Isn't that a surprise? Who would have guessed it? We'll be right back. Sup fam, it's your boy Darwin, aka Darwin underscore Darko, aka the most reasonable man in America, aka KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and we need to talk about Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, yeah, as I was reading, of course, I was reminded by one other thing I wanted to add to the mix, but uh, I'll remind you of uh, where we are. This uh, that's an interesting elaboration, right? So uh, it was the gubernatorial candidate in Minnesota who said, oh, I need to somehow adjust my abortion stance and the adjustment, the elaboration, as they put it here in the in the article here included uh, uh, suddenly all of a sudden now we're uh, once again embracing family and maternity leave, which uh, is totally pro-life and pro-family and all those stupid things. But for some reason, Republicans rejected them across the board anyway for different reasons. But uh, essentially, just they don't support those things at bottom. But now they're being forced to, and that's a good thing. A $2,500 per child adoption tax credit, which again, ordinarily, you might expect to see them in support of, but they were never, they just never showed up for the fight for those things. And now they have to. Plus, improving access to birth control, including providing oral contraceptives over the counter with a price ceiling. Nice. 
and uh, all of a sudden, all these things become a necessity. Uh, Mr. Walls, the governor there, said he would stay on offense and not accept any softening of the Republican line. I take them at their first word, he said, of Dr. Jensen and his running mate, Matt Burke, a former NFL player and an anti-abortion rights advocate. If they get the opportunity, they will criminalize this while we're trying to protect it. So it's become a central theme, obviously. I think that flip on their part was in response to that. So the thing I wanted to add, by the way, uh, jumping back to the fact that uh, they're having this debate, of course, in the West Virginia legislature as well as the Indiana state legislature, and everybody's sort of revealing their positions. I happen to see this one circulating yesterday. I've queued it up here from out of pocket. This uh, circulated by Rex Chapman, who's usually uh, kind of a Johnny on the spot with these video clips in the same way that uh, Asen and several others who've become uh, prominent names on Twitter are able to do. And this is a debate in West Virginia, the West Virginia State Senate during which Senator Robert Carnes, and who, I don't know, who are we talking about in West Virginia? Let me scroll back and see. That's Indiana. The West Virginia came before that. Brandon Steele, I guess, was the name that we called out. And this time it's somebody different. Robert Carnes making himself infamous. A West Virginia senator who, I guess they must have gotten to this topic via the abortion debate. Though it's entirely possible that they got there in a different way, but... Carnes is on tape here uh, debating. Uh, the other senator on his feet engaging in a debate is uh, identified later in the tape as the Democratic minority leader who gives the only possible response you can to something like this. This is, uh, well, I'll just play it for you after I tell you. Well, I'll have to read it out first. West Virginia Senator Robert Carnes says child rape victims, quote, romanticize relationships with their rapists. I think where he's trying to go is in saying that it will sometimes become difficult if you, like if you were to try to include an exception for rape, incest, life of the mother, etc., and a, uh, in many cases children who become pregnant this way will uh, be looking at two different exceptions, both the life of the mother and the rape, and maybe even the incest one as well, all wrapped up in one. But I guess, I, I don't know why I'm bothering to offer some, any kind of explanation or defense. He's trying to say that it might be difficult to make the call about whether or not it really was a rape because something, something, and the kids romanticize their relationship with rapists and might claim that there's uh, that that was consensual in some way. Now, hopefully there was also some discussion of the fact that, yes, that child would be terribly confused. And this is one of the reasons the law has an obligation to step in for them to the extent that anybody ever says anything like Robert Karn says they do. They could use some outside guidance and need to come to understand that, no, this isn't your boyfriend. This is your rapist. If you're 11 years old, it doesn't matter how you feel about it. Unfortunately, I, I hate to put it that way and heap trauma upon trauma, but, you know, we might have to intervene here. But uh, there's no really good way to enter into that conversation. The best thing you can do is stay out of that conversation. And that's what the Democrat in this case does. But I'll play you this clip. It's only just 20 seconds long here. Um you know, the, the, the dynamic in these relationships. I might have to uh, crank up the volume from uh, on the uh, the mix board here. Where can I get that and pump up the, uh, I guess we're playing it out of the uh, Firefox app. Is there any way to drive? Oh, yeah, right. Maybe we can crank up this thing here to uh, a higher volume and then give it another shot so you can hear that a little more clearly. You, you got to hear what this guy says. Um I don't know if they made you know, a difference the, the, or not. The dynamic in these relationships quite often is that the child has a very romanticized view of what's happening. They think this is their boyfriend. Would you agree with that? I don't now, that's a tough <laughs> spot to have to answer because like, would I agree with that? I mean, do I agree that it could happen? I guess it could happen. 
do I, are you asking me do I agree with what the kid is saying? No, I don't. And uh, this is the best possible answer, I, I guess, to a question like this. Matt, do you agree with that? I don't know what you're talking about, sir. You don't know what I'm talking about. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the answer comes from a Senator Baldwin, the minority leader, I guess, uh, as a Democrat there on the uh, on the, the Senate floor. So, yeah, uh, basically, that's a I don't know what you're talking about and keep digging if you really want to kind of an answer. So, well, anyway, I just thought I would add that to the to the mix because it's out there and people are seeing it and hearing this is what's going on when they mention in this article in the New York Times that people are taking this back to the state legislatures for debates and they're hotly debating these or these issues are hotly debated. I don't know how hot they are when they're debating these things, but I assume there's some heat involved. And uh, it's getting kind of, it's already uh, uncomfortable and gross and I don't want to talk about it anymore. But there you have it. And this is what their debate is. Well, you know, some of these kids, you know, maybe it's not rape or maybe they don't understand that it's rape. And I don't know. I mean, uh, with more context, I hope for Robert Carnes's sake that there was more context to it. And he was really trying to say, yeah, it's a mistake when these kids do that. And that's one of the reasons we have to step in as the state and say it's simply going to be statutory rape regardless of what the rest of the circumstances may be. You just can't do that because kids have a tendency to misunderstand what's going on or to rationalize this terrible thing that's happened to them by coming up with a different explanation. But it's not a real explanation and we would want to substitute adult judgment on their behalf. But very frequently you find out, nope, they're actually just weird and perverted and uh, they enjoy the fact that kids have this misconception because it helps keep them out of trouble for their pedophilia. But I don't know anything about Robert Carnes and maybe he's a fantastic guy. It's just a weird and uncomfortable clip to have circulating while you're trying to recalibrate on such a sub sensitive subject. So back to the New York Times to reach their conclusion. Uh, as the, we found out in Minnesota, Tim Walls says, yeah, take them at their word. When they say they want to ban all abortion, you should believe it and take less interest in the backpedaling that they're doing afterwards, except to point out that they don't really have a position. They're doing whatever it takes to scramble to find a sweet spot that they can get elected from, not speaking from the heart. The Kansas vote implies, this is interesting, that around 65% of voters nationwide would reject rolling back abortion rights, including a majority in more than 40 of the 50 states, according to a New York Times analysis that's linked here, if you would like to read that analysis, because that's quite a jump. I mean, it was uh, an overwhelming vote, I think, especially for Kansas to come up with a 60% or nearly 60% total on the no, but I guess what they're saying is taking into account how conservative Kansas is, nationwide you could expect, you know, given what we know about uh, partisan leanings in most states around the country, about six, an additional 5%, about 65% of voters, if asked, would reject rolling back abortion rights. Republicans believe their party can grab the mantle of moderation from Democrats. Well, that's very optimistic of you, in part by conveying empathy toward pregnant women for the first time ever, apparently, and offering exemptions to abortion bans and casting Democrats as the extremists when it comes to regulating abortion. If Democrats insist on making abortion the centerpiece of their campaigns, they argue, they risk looking out of touch with voters in an uncertain economy except the economy apparently doing considerably better and you guys doing considerably worse with this issue. But hey, why not just say the opposite? But Republicans who moderate their views must still contend with a core base of support that remains staunchly anti-abortion. Abortion opponents said Thursday that Republican candidates should not read too much into the Kansas vote. A single-issue referendum with language that was criticized by voters on both sides is confusing. Regardless of what the consultant class is telling the candidates, they would be wise to recognize that the right to life community is an important constituency, an important demographic of voters, warned Penny Nance, chief executive and president of Concerned Women for America, a conservative organization that opposes abortion rights. It is interesting. I mean, they will claim 
that no, 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 the you know, it, 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 this is where the true base of the Republican Party is. And they might even be right. But it'll be really interesting to watch people who have been posing as staunchly pro-life begin to realize that once again, they've created a monster in the Republican Party and they can't control it. And they will find themselves ousted from uh, positions of power in the Republican Party for trying to put themselves in line with the 65 percent of voters who will otherwise hang them for doing what the 35 percent are demanding of them. And and they're only 35 percent of their party at that. But anyway, after the Kansas vote, Democrats stepped up efforts to squeeze their opponents between a conservative base eager for quick action to ban all abortions and a broader electorate that wants no such thing. Representative Elaine Luria, a moderate Democrat running in a Republican-leaning district in southeastern Virginia, released a new advertisement against her Republican opponent, Jen uh, Kiggins, painting her as, quote, too extreme on abortion, which, mind you, had you done that in the uh, Republican primary, you would have been uh, accused of meddling for no good reason in the Republican primary and setting up Democrats for failure thanks to your stupid, dirty tricks. Saying the exact same thing, though, against your Republican opponent directly in the general election is the only sensible thing there is to do. But if you do it a month early, it's a dirty trick, apparently, according to the newspapers. Anyway, Ms. Luria had initially said she would campaign on her work for the district and her support for the Navy, a big force in the region. But the landscape has shifted. Ms. Kiggins' campaign did not respond to a request for comment. So interestingly there, I guess you could say, yes, everybody's shifting their position on how they'll approach November. Democrats as well. Okay, fair enough. A group aligned with the Democratic Governors Association is already advertising off abortion-related remarks made by Tudor Dixon. I like to say Tudor Dixon because it's so much funnier than Tudor of Michigan, who won the Republican nomination for governor this week. Everybody's going to have to do this. And and by the way, I'm very happy that Elaine Luria is going to have to campaign this way because otherwise her big plan was to do the kitchen table thing in the middle of like the hottest raging debates that America has faced and the most existential questions of the continuance of our democracy, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, she was going to campaign on, you know, the kitchen table thing, which, you know, at least the, the picture at the table is improving. That's true. But, you know, a large percentage of the country also wants some reassurance that you'll do more than just Uh, dither around at the margins of policy wonkery. But anyway, back to Tudor Dixon in Michigan. If you take Tudor Dixon at her word when it comes to outlawing abortion, she's told us exactly who she is. The uh, advertisement in question says it's titled No Exceptions and features clips of Ms. Dixon highlighting her opposition to a range of abortion-related exceptions. Ms. Dixon was unambiguous about her position earlier this summer, writing on Twitter, quote, my only exception is to protect the life, L-I-F-E capitalized, life of the mother. In a lengthy statement that highlighted her opposition to an expected ballot measure in Michigan intended to protect abortion rights, Ms. Dixon also insisted that her race would be defined by jobs, schools, crime, and being, quote, able to afford your gas and groceries. For Republicans, one problem might be the extensive trail on the issue they've left during the primary season. And, of course, another issue would be more people more easily able to afford their gas and groceries, and everything's kind of going okay with jobs. And the problem in schools appears to be that uh, Republicans keep accusing every teacher of being a pedophile. So, hmm. Maybe that's not great. For people who are involved in the PTA, the T, of course, being teachers, tell all the parents that they're in a uh, bake sale club with a bunch of pedophiles. They're really going to appreciate that. Anyway, in May, Mr. Mastriano in Pennsylvania was unequivocal as he courted Republican primary voters. That baby deserves a right to life, whether it is conceived in incest or rape or there are concerns otherwise for the mom. Thanks, dude. Last month, he said it was not up to him. You decide on exceptions. You decide on how early. And that's in the hands of the people, he said, 
on Philadelphia Talk Radio. That's a fact. That's not a dodge, except that it is, in fact, a dodge of the position that he was taking to get through the primary and be the gubernatorial nominee. Anyway, very interesting and a pretty good summation of where we are, thanks to the New York Times, which does, in fact, sometimes do some pretty good reporting, although sometimes makes horrific and very egregious errors uh, in favor of the worst people in the world. Okay, let's see. Other things to add to the mix. Uh, I thought this might be a good Friday addition to things. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of them here that uh, might make good Friday reading. All right, usually I don't like to read Dana Milbank because he's the dick whisperer, and I still am angry at him about that. But, um, Eh, let's add this to the mix. I thought this was kind of an interesting opinion piece the because uh, it uh, reconfirms all our priors, uh, especially with respect to someone that we think is one of the worst people in the world, Newt Gingrich. The GOP, the GOP, is sick. I agree. It didn't start with Trump, and it won't end with him, says everybody in the world, but in this case, Dana Milbank in particular. It began where it ended, on the west front of the United States Capitol, on January 6th, 2021, an armed mob invited and incited by President Donald Trump smashed barriers, overpowered police, and stormed the Capitol. The insurrectionists scaled the scaffolding erected for President-elect Joe Biden's inauguration and proceeded to sack the seat of government for the first time since the War of 1812. Called to Washington by Trump, who promised a wild time, and sent to the Capitol with instructions to, quote, fight like hell... The mob halted Congress's certification of Biden's victory, sending lawmakers and staff fleeing for their lives. At least seven people died in the riot or its aftermath, and more than 140 police officers were hurt. Some 845 insurrectionists, several with ties to white supremacist or violent extremist groups, have faced charges including seditious conspiracy. Many Americans were shocked that Trump, after first considering a plan to seize voting machines, had orchestrated an attempted coup, knowingly dispatching armed attackers to Capitol Hill and then refusing for 187 minutes to call off the assault. And many Americans have been shocked anew to see elected Republicans, after initially condemning Trump's attack on democracy, excuse his actions and rationalize the violent insurrection itself as, quote, legitimate political discourse. But a sober look at history might have lessened the shock, for the seeds of sedition had been planted earlier, a quarter century earlier, in the same spot on the west front of the Capitol. What are we talking about? And by the way, uh, you know, that quarter century kind of coincides with, as I said, the last time that Rick Santorum was ever elected to public office and won an election and yet he's uh, out there leading the charge, not only being interviewed uh, every day, basically, on CNN for, hey, what? give us your take on the pulse of American politics, but also at the tip of the spear in the call for a constitutional convention of the states. I haven't won an election in 25 years, and I haven't served in public office at any capacity for almost 20 years. Let me be the one to help you decide how to rewrite your constitution because I'm definitely closely in touch with where people are politically and that's why I haven't been relevant for 20 years. Hmm. Anyway, so what is Milbank talking about? This thing happening 25 years ago right there in the same place in the west front of the Capitol on September 27th, 1994 with more than 300 Republican members of Congress and congressional candidates gathered where the insurrectionists would one day mount the scaffolding. On that sunny morning, they assembled for a nonviolent transfer of power. Bob Michael, the unfailingly genial leader of the House Republican minority for the previous 14 years, had ushered Ronald Reagan's agenda through the House, but he was being forced into retirement by a rising bomb thrower who threatened to oust Michael as GOP leader if he didn't quit. My friends, a wistful Michael told the gathering, I'll not be able to be with you when you enter that promised land of having that long sought after majority. Newt Gingrich had almost nothing in common with the man he shoved aside. Michael was a portrait of civility and decency, a World War II combat veteran who knew that his political opponents were not his enemies and that politics was the art of compromise. Gingrich, by contrast, 
rose to prominence by forcing the resignation of a Democratic Speaker of the House on what began as mostly false allegations by smearing another Democratic Speaker with personal innuendo and by routinely thwarting Michael's attempts to negotiate with Democrats. Gingrich had avoided service in Vietnam and regarded Democrats as the enemy, impugning their patriotism and otherwise savaging them nightly on the House floor for the benefit of C-SPAN viewers. Uh, Newt, 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 the candidates and lawmakers chanted, a pudgy 51-year-old, younger than I am right now, isn't that amazing, with a helmet of gray hair approached the lectern, the fact that America is in trouble, the fact is that America is in trouble, the beginning of the America is a hellhole theme. Gingrich declared, it is impossible to maintain American civilization with 12-year-olds having babies. Hmm, that's weird, huh? 15-year-olds killing each other, 17-year-olds dying of AIDS, and 18-year-olds getting diplomas that they can't even read. The pejoratives piled up in Gingrich's shouted, finger-wagging harangue, collapsing failed so totally, worried about their jobs, worried about their safety, trust broke down, out of touch, wasteful, dumb, ineffective, out of balance, malaise, drug dealers, pimps, prostitution, crime, barbarism, devastation, human tragedy, chaos and poverty. Recognize that if America fails, our children will live on in a dark and bloody planet, Gingrich told them. And remember, this was all calculated, and each one of those terms individually focus-tested by Frank Luntz, who now thinks uh, he can, I guess, redeem himself as an anti-Trumper. But those, all those speeches were designed, word by word, to do exactly what they did do and lead to Trump in the end. So in that sense, uh, Milbank has got it correct, I think. Somewhere in this catalog of catastrophe, Gingrich signed the contract with America. A 10-point agenda proposing a balanced budget amendment, congressional term limits, and other reforms, none of which, by the way, have ever come to pass. We have become in danger of losing our own civilization, Gingrich warned. Americans had seldom heard a politician talk this way, and certainly not a Speaker of the House, but that's what Gingrich became after the GOPS landslide victory in the 1994 election. The contract with America made little headway, only three minor provisions, Paperwork reduction, among them, became law, but the rise of Gingrich and his shock troops set the nation on a course toward the ruinous politics of today. I'll give them a little bit more credit than that. The Congressional Review Act was a part of that and still and not only was passed, but still survives today and is still used to do things like occasionally roll back the stupid and harmful regulations of the closing days of the Trump administration. But I digress. Much has been made of the ensuing polarization in our politics, and it's true that moderates are a vanishing breed, but the problem isn't primarily polarization. The problem is that one of our two major political parties has ceased good faith participation in the democratic process. Of course, there are instances of violence, disinformation, racism, and corruption among Democrats and the political left. You have to say that, apparently, because... He's still a big believer in both sides in it. But the scale isn't at all comparable, and that's at least a concession to reality. One or only one party fomented a bloody insurrection, and even after that voted in large numbers, 139 House Republicans, two-thirds of the majority of the House Republicans, to overturn the will of the voters in the 2020 election. Only one party promotes a web of conspiracy theories in place of facts. Only one party is trying to restrict voting and discredit elections. Only one party is stoking fear of minorities and immigrants. Admittedly, he says, I'm partisan, not for Democrats, but with a capital D, but for Democrats, lowercase d. Republicans have become an authoritarian faction fighting democracy. And there's a perfectly logical reason for this. Democracy is working against Republicans. In the eight presidential contests since 1988, the GOP candidate has won a majority of the popular vote only once in 2004. And yet they've been president pretty much since then, like since since 1980. I guess that means not counting 1988, but uh, they, they seem to have a pretty good shot at winning the presidency in each contest, despite the fact that they haven't won a majority but once. 
As the United States approaches majority minority status, the white population, 76% of the country in 1990, is now 58% and will drop below 50% around 2045. Republicans have become the voice of white people, particularly those without college degrees, who fear the loss of their way of life in a multicultural America. White grievance and white fear drive Republican identity more than any other factor and in turn drive the tribalism and dysfunction of the United States political system. Other factors sped the party's turn toward nihilism. Concurrent with the rise of Gingrich was the ascent of conservative talk radio, followed by the triumph of Fox News, followed by the advent of social media. Combined, they created a media environment that allows Republican politicians and their voters to seal themselves in an echo chamber of alternative facts. Globally, South to North migration has ignited nationalist movements around the world and created a new era of autocrats. The disappearance of the greatest generation, tempered by war, brought to power a new generation of culture warriors. But the biggest cause is race. The parties resorted themselves after the epochal changes of the 1960s, which expanded civil rights, voting rights, and immigration. Richard Nixon's Southern strategy began an appeal to white voters alienated by racial progress, and in the years that followed, a new generation of Republicans took that racist undertone and made it the melody. It is crucial to understand that Donald Trump didn't create this noxious environment. He isn't some hideous orange Venus emerging from the half shell. Rather, he is brilliantly opportunist. He saw the direction the Republican Party was taking and the appetites it was stoking. The one-time pro-choice advocate of universal health care reinvented himself to give Republicans what they wanted. Because Trump is merely a reflection of the sickness in the GOP, the problem won't go away when he does. And when will he? Jeez. Republicans and their allied donors, media outlets, interest groups, and fellow travelers have been yanking on the threads of democracy and civil society for the past quarter century. That's a long time. And the unraveling is considerable. So that seems fairly true. Where were we on this? Uh, you can measure it in the triumph of lies and disinformation and the mainstreaming of racism and white supremacy, in the erosion of institutions and norms of government, and in the dehumanizing of opponents and stoking of violence. In the process, Republicans became deconstructionists. They destroyed truth. They destroyed decency, patriotism, national unity, racial progress, and their own party, and they are well on their way to destroying the world's oldest democracy. Well, that's kind of rude, isn't it? We'll be right back. Welcome back now to the K-Grown in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. That's quite a list already from Dana Milbank, but guess what? There's more, and I actually do think we perhaps ought to consider with his, uh, continue with his restatement of this issue. Um, consider just a few of the milestones along this path of destruction, all of which we can now see made Trump possible, if not inevitable. Long before Trump promulgated more than 30,000 falsehoods during his presidency, including disinformation about the COVID-19 pandemic that contributed to countless deaths, there was more. House Republicans, these are all bullet points here. <clears throat> First, that House Republicans encouraged the conspiracy theory that Vince Foster, a lawyer in the Clinton White House, had been murdered, possibly in the beliefs, craziest formulation, by Hillary Clinton. After four separate independent investigations concluded it was a suicide, Gingrich said, I just don't accept it. And one of his committee chairmen, Dan Burton, shot a watermelon in his backyard to reenact the quote-unquote murder. I remember that happening as well. There was the George W. Bush administration to make the case for war, distorting the available intelligence to suggest that Iraq was responsible somehow for the 9-11 attacks, that it was on the cusp of obtaining nuclear weapons, and that U.S. troops would be greeted as liberators. When a former diplomat publicly disputed Bush's false claims, AIDS retaliated by disclosing the identity of his wife, a CIA operative. And let's not forget that as uh, Liz Cheney does her best on the January 6th committee and uh, garners occasional accolades for doing so, and Dick Cheney himself... <clears throat> 
emerging from retirement to film a fairly strong statement calling Donald Trump the greatest threat to democracy that exists today or whatever the formulation was that he used. All quite admirable, but uh, let's not forget that it was Dick Cheney at the bottom both of this case for war against Iraq and when challenged, uh, revealing the identity of a then still active CIA operative in order to try to benefit some that, from it politically somehow. Uh, he's done some of the worst things there were to do. Then, of course, Sarah Palin, the party's vice presidential nominee in 2008, falsely proclaimed in 2009 the existence of death panels in Barack Obama's Affordable Care Act. Of course, it turns out that the death panels were the Republicans themselves sentencing pregnant women and girls to death in uh, dire circumstances, ectopic pregnancies, etc., etc. Um, but hey, never mind all of that. Republican lawmakers lined up to make the false claim a centerpiece of their attempt to defeat Obamacare. About a third of Americans came to believe this falsehood. Long before Trump spoke of immigrants as rapists and murderers coming from, you know what, whole countries, and told Democratic Congresswomen of color to go back to other countries, there was Pat Buchanan, who ran insurgent bids for the GOP nomination in 1992 and 1996, offering generous words for Hitler lamenting the treatment of European Americans and non-Jewish whites, warning of a migrant invasion, and running on a promise to put America first. What do you know? Then there was conservative radio giant Rush Limbaugh aired the song Barack the Magic Negro, because that was acceptable, apparently. Fox News' Glenn Beck claimed President Obama had a deep-seated hatred for white people, and Tea Party activists had chanted the N-word at black members of Congress outside the Capitol. That might have been an indicator of more to come, don't you think? Fox News in 2011 served as the forum for Trump and others to perpetrate the birther libel, asserting that Obama, the first black president, was not American-born. Palin told Obama to stop his shuck and jive shtick hmm. and representative steve king remember him said in 2013 of the dreamers those brought illegally to the united states as children for everyone who's a valedictorian there's another hundred out there that weigh 130 pounds and they've got calves the size of cantaloupes because they're hauling 75 pounds of marijuana across the desert wow that's nice of you. Long before Trump told the violent Proud Boys to stand by instead of condemning them, conservative radio host G. Gordon Libby in 1994 told listeners that if federal agents try to disarm them, go for the headshot and kill the sons of bitches. Other hosts and GOP members of Congress warned of federal agents in black helicopters planning a paramilitary-style attack against Americans and the need for an armed revolution to resist the New World Order. And Gingrich and other Republicans spoke supportively of anti-government militias. Thousands of Tea Party activists on the eve of final passage of Obamacare in the House in 2010 got within 50 feet of the Capitol. Democrats worried about violence and police officers struggled to maintain security, but... GOP lawmakers inflamed the crowd, waving signs and leading chants of kill the bill. Palin, urging supporters, don't retreat, instead reload. In 2010, haha, ha, wink, wink, promoted a map of 20 Democratic-held congressional districts in target crosshairs. A GOP Senate nominee spoke of using Second Amendment rep remedies, Threats and vandalism against Democratic lawmakers spread, and in 2011, Representative Gabby Giffords, a Democrat of Arizona, one of those listed in Palin's map, was, in fact, shot by a gunman who killed six others. There was no evidence connecting Palin's map to the shooting, but the violent rhetoric continued afterward. Long before Trump discredited Democratic institutions with his big lie about election fraud, Republican operatives intimidated the Miami-Dade County Elections Department into stopping the recount of the 2000 election results. A partisan crowd flooded into the elections office, chanting, Stop the fraud, stop the count, and cheaters, 
Democratic officials were kicked, pushed, and punched. John Ashcroft, who became Attorney General after the Supreme Court's 5-4 decision in Bush v. Gore handed the presidency to George W. Bush, falsely claimed in 2001 that dead people had voted and that votes have been bought, voters intimidated, and ballot boxes stuffed. The big lie way before Donald Trump, right? The dead voter thing, too. Where did I just read? Oh, yes, right, the Arizona... Uh, um, uh, fake audit led by cyber ninjas, etc. Uh, finally finished uh, following up on all the leads in which Republicans claimed that dead voters had cast ballots and found out, nope, pretty much none of them actually happened. I think one turned out to actually have been dead and had somebody else file the uh, file, uh, 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 submit their ballot. But uh, I think they investigated nearly 250 individual cases pointed out by Republicans claiming that uh, dead people had voted. And in almost all of them, it turned out, nope, those people are still alive. And for the rest of them, they were alive, cast their ballots, subsequently died, but their date of death is post-election. And it was pretty easy to see if you had just looked in the records. But anyway, a digression. More uh, instances of things that you would recognize as part of Trump's campaign to destroy America happening way before he ever declared for public office. There was Majority Leader, then House Majority Leader, Tom DeLay in 2003, trying to create a permanent majority by forcing through a Texas redistricting that shifted six House seats to Republicans in between um, uh, the ordinary uh, decennial redistricting. And when Democratic legislators left the state to block the scheme, DeLay attempted to use the FBI and the Federal Aviation Administration to track them down. The Supreme Court's conservative majority stacked the deck for Republicans with its 2010 Citizens United decision, which made it possible for wealthy interests to flood elections with unlimited, unregulated, dark money, and its 2013 gutting of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which invited GOP-led states to restrict voting in ways that disproportionately affect voters of color. Republican senators cemented the high court's reputation as an arm of the GOP, when from 2016 until into 2017, they blocked Obama for 11 months from filling the vacancy left by Justice Antonin Scalia's death. Long before the dysfunction of the Trump era, Gingrich in 1995 announced that he forced the shutdown of the federal government in part because he was asked to exit Air Force One via the rear stairway after a trip to Israel with President Bill Clinton. Republicans debuted a new era of manufactured crises over debt limit deadlines and repeated government shutdowns whenever Democrats held the White House. The Republican National Committee drafted an autopsy in 2013 after Mitt Romney lost to Obama, calling for more outreach to black, Hispanic, Asian, and gay Americans. GOP lawmakers in the House swiftly abandoned that idea, killing a comprehensive immigration reform bill that had sailed through the Senate by a bipartisan 68 to 32. Can you even imagine that happening now? House Speaker John Boehner announced his retirement in 2015, later saying he was disgusted with the growing circle of crazy inside his party. Republicans couldn't govern at all, Boehner wrote. Incrementalism? Compromise? That wasn't their thing. Boehner wrote of the insurgents, a lot of them wanted to blow up Washington. They wanted wedge issues and conspiracies and crusades. Boehner concluded that he was living in crazy town. Every second of every day since Barack Obama became president, I was fighting one bat-ass idea after another. A lot, of, a lot of fun language today. Against that quarter century of ruin, what we are living through today is just a continuation of the GOP's direction for the past 30 years. The appeals to white nationalism, the sabotage of the functions of government, the routine embrace of disinformation, stoking the fiction of elections fraud and the big lie and steady degradation of democracy. Now it seems that degradation is accelerating. We see this in the determined efforts by Republican leaders to ignore or discredit the truths being revealed by the House January 6th Select Committee. Trump demanding magnetometers be removed on January 6th so that his armed supporters could attend his rally and then march on the Capitol. 
Trump ignoring pleas from aides and family members to intervene on January 6th to stop the bloodshed. Trump seriously entertaining the seizing of voting machines and attempting to install new leaders at the Justice Department who would support his false fraud claims. And Trump's allegedly still active attempts to tamper with witnesses before the committee. As they avert their gaze from the cascading horrors of the failed coup, Republicans are instead looking to a familiar guide, Gingrich, who also hasn't been in elected office for 25 years. The former speaker, now a board member of the pro-Trump America First Policy Institute, why is anybody paying him anything, announced this year that he is serving as a consultant to House GOP leader Kevin McCarthy and his team, who really needs help and can't find any from Gingrich, I'm sure. No sooner had this been disclosed than Gingrich on Fox News threatened the imprisonment of lawmakers serving on the January 6th committee, saying they're, quote, going to face a real risk of jail after Republicans take over Congress, throwing political opponents in jail for investigating an attack on the U.S. Capitol and a coup against the U.S. government. Yes, yes. Replied Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney, one of the two Republicans on the committee, this is what it looks like when the rule of law unravels. But Gingrich knows that. He's the one who first started tugging at the threads. All right, fine, you did a good job, Dana, compiling all this stuff. And we grudgingly uh, acknowledge your uh, contribution to today's show. Still don't like him very much. By the way, interesting comment made by Peter Manso about this. The collage of uh, illustrations, of you know, photo-like illustrations of all the various contributors to this mess in the Republican circles that illustrates this piece. Uh, Peter Manso making the uh, accurate and interesting observation that there were no references to the religious leaders behind this or symbols of the religious fervor of the of the radical religious right driving all of this. And it's actually quite a big missing component in all this. So I think I thought a good point and I should probably make note that Peter's tweet ought to be uh, included in the roundup for today. And we'll see if I can remember that. So note to self. All right. Switching gears, because why not? That's what we do on Friday. And uh, on top of which, just, you know, in reverse chronological order, this is what's in pocket. So uh, it's really less about a theme and more about, oh, there's a thing in front of my eyes right now. But I thought this was of some interest. Returning to a theme we haven't really explored in some time, mostly since the candidacy of Mitt Romney way back when, when we talked about it and a few times in between then and now, the very nature of private equity and, um, well, I guess to some extent, venture capital investment firms, hedge funds, etc., uh, all back in the news thanks to the attempt to curtail the carried interest loophole, which apparently even that mild attempt at reform is being jettisoned from the reconciliation bill at the request of Kirsten Cinema, who for you know no good reason has decided to make herself the guardian of this otherwise really indefensible loophole. So it's worth bringing it back to uh, our attention. Um, but again, this is stuff that we pretty much concluded during the um, Mitt Romney uh, candidacy because he brought it to the fore being that he was a, a private equity uh, advisor, a hedge fund advisor, and uh, this is what he did for a living. This is how he made his fortune. Private equity doesn't want you to read this, says Farad Manju, who wrote it for the New York Times. And yet here we are reading it. This column is about the excesses of the private equity investment industry. It delves into the minutia of the tax code, corporate structure, and certain abstruse practices of financial engineering. There will be jargon. Oh, yes, there will be jargon. Carried interest. That's the jargon we're talking about these days. Leveraged buyout. Joint liability. I am aware that none of this is anyone's favorite thing to be discussing on a summer's day, but private equity is counting on your lack of interest. The seeming impenetrability of its practices has been called one of its superpowers, among the reasons the trillion-dollar industry keeps getting away with it. 
with what? An accelerating behind the scenes desiccation of the American economy. What did we call it way back in the day? Uh, locust capitalism was my term for it. Uh, remember the older, the other terms that people use for it from the old days, vampire squid, I think, was actually supposed to be about something else, but was a pretty good descriptor of the way private equity was working. But uh, yeah, vampire capitalism, another good word for it. Uh, but I love the locust capitals moving on from one target to the next and devouring everything. That was my image. Democrats in the Senate are now poised to pass a rule. They're no longer poised to pass that rule that might slightly clip the industry's wings. A change to the tax code that would force partners in private equity firms, hedge fund managers and venture capitalists to pay a fairer share of the taxes uh, that are due on the money that they make. But private equity has wrangled out of proposed legislation before, and it could well do so again. Senator Kirsten Sinema, the Arizona Democrat who has often frustrated her party's agenda, is the lone holdout. She has previously expressed opposition to raising taxes on the wealthy. Hmm. And she has declined to say whether she will vote for the current proposal, but apparently she's giving out uh, indications that she will not. Uh, since this was first written, even though it was published yesterday. I can't fathom what her reluctance might be. One of private equity's main plays is the leveraged buyout, which involves borrowing, borrowing huge sums of money to gobble up companies in the hopes of restructuring them and one day selling them for a gain. It's basically like house flipping, I would say, right? You take out a loan, you buy something, I mean, with at least on the house flipping shows, in order to maintain visual interest, they buy real dumps and turn them into something good. In the business world, it's somewhat less clear that that's what they're doing. They're sometimes buying perfectly well-functioning companies and just eating them from the inside out and taking all the money and take, using their <clears throat> their ability to borrow capital against an established business interest and just looting it and taking the money and running away and just declaring bankruptcy on behalf of the company they've just bought and just departing with whatever they've been able to take away that wasn't nailed down and even prying up some of what was. But okay, back to the actual written product here. Uh, where were we? Uh, one of private equity's main plays is the leveraged buyout, which involves borrowing huge sums of money, which fiscal conservatives are against, except for some reason they love it in Congress and protect tax breaks for doing this is what's happening here. But the acquired companies, he continues, which range across just about every economic sector from retailing to food to health care and housing are often overloaded with debt to the point of unsustainability. They frequently slash jobs and benefits for employees and cut services and hike prices for consumers and sometimes even endanger lives and undermine the social fabric. And it's not entirely made clear in this article, but we'll use our background knowledge of it, of why that is the case. And what they're doing is loading the companies up with debt. And the reason that they then slash jobs and benefits for employees, cut services and hike prices for consumers is to try to make the money back that they would then use to service that debt. And if they can do it, great, because no skin off their nose, it's just debt being paid off. And if they can't, well, they declare bankruptcy and leave the garbage heap behind and move on to the next target, like locusts. It is a dismal record. Private equity firms presided over many of the largest retailer bankruptcies in the last decade, among them Toys R Us, Sears, Radio Shack, and Payless Shoe Source, resulting in nearly 600,000 jobs lost, according to a 2019 study by several left-leaning economic policy advocates. But... Uh, yeah, why wouldn't those things naturally? How do we know that they caused the bankruptcy of Toys R Us, Sears, Radio Shack, and Payless Shoe Stores? Couldn't it have been natural? Might it not have been, let's say, the natural evolution of human beings away from needing cheap shoes? Hmm, probably not. Or the uh, massive movement against toys among children. Children will never need toys again. What's the point, right? Or Sears. Things of all sorts that you might want or need around the house. F that, of course, you know, you get the idea. Anyway, 
uh, I suppose you could blame it on Amazon.com, but not everybody was mail ordering everything in the world at the time. Anyway, other investigations have shown that when private equity firms buy houses and apartments, and they are doing that, and you wouldn't think it, but apparently it's one of the hot sectors. When they buy houses and apartments, rents and evictions soar. When they buy hospitals and doctor's practices, hmm, the cost of care shoots up. When they buy nursing homes, patient mortality rises. When they buy newspapers, reporting on local governments dries up and participation in local elections declines. All linked, by the way, if you want to look at the studies. It is unclear even if private equity pays off for the investors, like university endowments, public pension funds, and wealthy individuals who put their money into the industry in the hopes of outsized returns. Since at least 2006, according to a study by the economist Ludovic uh, Falipu, the performance of the largest private equity funds has essentially, well, matched returns comparable to publicly traded companies. So it's not clear that they're any better than regular investment in the stock market. Still, the industry has been growing quickly. And if you wonder why, the answer follows, I think. And it had a record year in 2021. According to McKinsey, private equity's total assets under management reached almost $6.3 trillion last year. The American Investment Council, a trade group representing the industry, says that companies backed by private equity firms employ nearly 12 million Americans. With the help of lax regulation and indefensible tax loopholes, private equity's apparent destructiveness can be enormously profitable for its partners. Private equity firms make money by extracting hefty fees from their investors and from the companies they purchase meaning they can succeed even if their investments go kaput. Filippo found that between 2005 and 2020, the industry produced 19 multi-billionaires. It's a heads-I-win-tails-you-lose model, said Jim Baker, the executive director of a watchdog group called the Private Equity Stakeholder Project. And I like the fact that he uses stakeholder there. But it gets worse. Not only do private equity partners make money even if their companies blow up, they also get a pretty good deal from the government on what they earn. And this is the big problem here uh, for current politics. Private equity funds generally charge their investors two different fees. A management fee of 2% of invested assets per year. Funds are held for an average of about six years, by the way, and a carried interest fee that is 20% of any investment gains realized in the fund. In most other industries, the IRS would categorize a fee like carried interest as ordinary income, like how your salary is taxed, rather than a capital gain, which is, of course, how stock market winnings are taxed. After all, the partners are receiving them as compensation for performing a service, managing the investor's money, not collecting a gain on their own invested capital because it's the investor's money, not theirs. But for some strange reason, that's not how it works for partnerships like private equity, hedge funds, and venture capital firms. Under IRS guidelines, carried interest is taxed as a capital gain, which has a top rate of 20% rather than as income, which has a top rate of nearly 40%. The upshot? Millionaire and billionaire partners in private equity firms pay a far lower tax rate on much of their income than many of the rest of us. And remember, by the way, the excuse for having a lower capital gains tax, which is always, that money's already been taxed. It was taxed when corporations uh, reported it as profit, and now that's being passed on. And to tax it again when it lands in my bank account would be considered, for some reason, double taxation, even though it's new income to you. Yes, a company paid taxes on it, but sure, I mean... Why is there sales tax charged on people when they buy things? Wasn't that money already taxed when you earned it? Why is it being taxed again when you spend it? Nobody ever calls that double taxation. But for some reason, this is double taxation. Okay, so fine. Let's suppose you believe that it is double taxation, that when a corporation earns money, pays taxes on it, then pays part of what's left to you as a dividend 
on your investment, that taxing that again would be double taxation uh, because, of course, that was your invested money and uh, it, the returns are coming back to you after having you know, been taxed. But in the case of a private equity firm, uh, it, it never really was. And it's not return on an investment. It's simply being paid to you as salary for managing the account. There's no reason to think that that was double taxed. It's never double taxed when you're talking about people, you know, a bank manager being paid out of the bank's profits, which were taxed at one point, and then just earning their salary. But for some reason, they just told the IRS, we're extremely rich, and we pay a lot of money to contribute money to politicians, and they vote to tell you to do the opposite of what's going on here. And so they do. The private equity industry defends its preferential tax rate by citing sweat equity, which is pretty amazing. Even if partners don't put much of their own capital at stake, they're being rewarded for investing their ideas and energy. Let's talk about what those ideas really are. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options, too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. One last segment here to finish up this story about private equity industry and their carried interest loophole, which appears poised to survive yet again, thanks this time to Kirsten Cinema. Uh, as we were saying when we left here, the private equity industry defends its preferential tax rate by citing sweat equity, which is really something, I mean, given the fact that these guys, to break a sweat, I mean, other than like maybe on the pickleball court or something, uh, it's not sweat work that they're doing, but calling it sweat equity. And it's particularly uh, galling, of course, to call it sweat equity when the people who actually sweat to make this thing work or any of these companies work never get a share of their sweat equity. It's all about, well, you know, you, you'll be paid the lowest possible wage. And remember, uh, payroll is a cost center and every dollar paid in wages is a dollar that they can't otherwise loot and take home with themselves. There's no respect for sweat equity. The, 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 the dollars go to the shareholders, not the stakeholders. Sweat equity is worth nothing if you're sweating in a blue collar. But if you're sweating in a platinum collar, you know, or rather uh, making telephone calls about who else should sweat from your vacation home while you're looting these companies, now you have sweat equity. Amazing. And by the way, uh, even if you tried to uh, say that sweat equity is something that you can gain from investing your own hard-earned capital and putting it at risk in order to grow the company... If you, if you tried to make that claim, of course, <clears throat> what, what's the problem with that? It's not your own money that these private equity places are putting into these. This is, remember, these are people opening a storefront essentially and saying, rich people, give me a million of your dollars and I'll pool it all together and then I'll use it to do this corporate rating and we'll steal all the money from out of these corporations. I'll pay uh, some of it to you, but most of it to me. First of all, for every million dollars you give me, I'm going to take 2% or I'll take, even if it's a hundred million dollars, I take 2%. So what's the math on that? Somebody can do that. What's uh, uh 2%? Oh, damn it. I can't even think of these. Things. So a million dollars means what? 20,000? I don't know. Why can't I think mathematically at the moment? Uh, I, I panic and think I 
can't deal with the calculations here. But all right, I'm going to just double check here. A million dollars times 2%, $20,000. For every million dollars that goes in, I'm going to get 20000 just for the sweat that I broke, asking you for the money, taking it, logging it in my computer as having been taken. I'll put your name next to it and everything. Right off the bat, for doing that, even if I don't invest it in anything, I made $20,000 for every million. And some of these people are putting millions and millions in and several of them, what did they say? There's $6.3 trillion under management. Um, so in management fees alone, somebody else do that math. I can't do it. I don't even think my calculator will take numbers that high. Six, three, so 63,000, 630,000, 6 million, 630,000,000, 6,630,000,000, 6.3 trillion dollars times 0.02, that's, uh oh, here we go, $126 billion in fees alone, just for taking the money and logging it, and with your name next to it. And then if I blow it all, I still keep that as a fee. But then on top of that, 20% of any gains go to me. So, you know, it's still a good deal if you actually make any gains in terms of, you know, uh, if, if they're outsized gains and you get to keep 80% of them as the investor. But remember what this means is the sweat equity of my asking, can I have a billion dollars? I can. Thank you. I'll write down who gave it to me. Then I'll use it to buy a company and explode it and steal all the money from it. And then I'll take $20,000 out of every million you gave me and pocket it just for writing your name down plus 20% of anything I steal from this company goes to me. That's the sweat. There's no sweat, except, you know, I imagine in the beginning, there was the sweat of, will this law stick? Are they going to not come and arrest me? I mean, I'm just stealing a ton of money. So I guess that maybe the first people, the first go around sweated a little bit, like maybe I, what I'm doing is illegal, but it turns out not to be. And Kirsten Cinema loves it, apparently. Okay, so this is... Uh, this is the explanation. Private equity defends its preferential tax rate. Imagine giving this a preferential tax rate on top of it all. I mean, even at tax at maximum rate, you're still raking in billions and billions of dollars and creating billionaires left and right. With the regular tax, with a, with a, by penalizing it with taxes, they'd still be making billions of dollars. But giving it a preferential rate on top of that, all protected thanks to sweat equity. And this is even if partners are not putting much of their own capital at stake. Now they might be because they have billions of their own. They can put it into private equity uh, and steal even more money or keep more of what's stolen for themselves. Well, anyway, as they say, partners don't invest much of their own capital, but they're being rewarded for investing their ideas and energy. The idea being, what company should I steal and ruin? And... How hard should I try to steal the money? That's the energy. This, according to Steve Klinsky, the former chair of the American Investment Council, and how he put it in a recent article. But it's difficult to find many beyond the industry who will defend carried interests, low taxation. I found one, Kirsten Cinema. She's the one. Barack Obama called for the loophole to be eliminated. Donald Trump <laughs> pledged to eliminate it. So did Joe Biden, of course. Even several financial tycoons have called for its repeal. Jamie Dimon, Bill Ackman, and Warren Buffett among them. Despite widespread opposition, though, the tax break has somehow endured. As Tim Murphy wrote recently in Mother Jones, it has been, quote, the most unkillable bad idea in a town with no shortage of them, a testament to the unstoppable combination of money and inertia. Murphy's piece was part of an excellent multi-part investigation of the private equity industry published by the magazine, says our author in this. The Democrats' latest tax proposal merely narrows but does not eliminate the carried interest loophole. Passing it would be a good start toward reforming the private equity industry, and I hope cinema can see her way through intense lobbying pressure and sign on to it. Even if it passes, though, much more would need to be done. Eileen Applebaum, an expert on the private equity industry who is a co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a liberal think tank, told me she favored many of the ideas in the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, 
a bill introduced last year by Senator Elizabeth Warren and several other liberal Democrats. The act would impose lots of new rules on the industry, including limiting tax deductions on excessive debt and adding worker protections for when debt binges lead to bankruptcy. One of the most important ideas, Applebaum said, is known as joint liability, which would hold private equity firms responsible for the debt incurred by portfolio companies if the companies go belly up. In other words, if you buy a company with a leveraged buyout thanks to private equity that's invested with you and you bust it out, you assume joint liability and bankruptcy for the debts of the company. Oh, that'll change the picture. Yes, you can't just walk away. It doesn't tell you how much debt you can put on it, Applebaum said. It just says whatever debt you put on it, the company that is, you're going to be jointly responsible. If you tell the company borrow this money and they borrow it and they go bust as a result, you need to bear some responsibility for that. That seems only fair. That struck me as an elegant and sensible idea In private, if private equity first Firms claim that they should get credit for their sweat equity. Why shouldn't they be held responsible when this sweat turns to tears? That's a good question. And something to remember. As Kirsten Cinema says, Meh, never mind. Let the sweat stay sweat. Golden sweat. That nobody breaks a sweat, but they call it sweat and then steal all your money. I mean, I think when we talked about this under the in the Bain Capital days, uh, we made it a little clearer that essentially what you're, if you, you do is you buy a company, whether it be Toys R Us, Staples or anybody, buy a company. They're all for sale if you put up enough money. How do you get the money to do that? Well, of course, one, you get people to invest in your private equity firm and you can borrow even more even if you don't get it. But you get your billionaires to give you a million dollars a piece. Take 20000 off the top and put it in your pocket just for the act of writing their names down and then take the money buy the company, and then take the good name of the company you've bought, Staples, Toys R Us, whatever it may be, and go to the bank that Staples or Toys R Us used before you bought them that they have a relationship with and say, we'd like to uh, take out a business loan. We want to, you know, something, something, improve our yada yadas, our back end fulfillment, whatever it is, build a new uh, warehouse, hire more people, automate our equipment, modernize what we automated last time, whatever it is. And the bank says, OK, you know, those are things that get done and I'll loan you $10 million to do it. And then you, as the private equity firm that has just bought this thing, you, of course, you've bought it. You're the majority shareholder. Now you put yourself on the board. You approve seeking that loan from the bank. The loan money comes in, and the first thing you do is you say, instead of modernizing anything, let's first pay bonuses to the board. Success! You got an additional $10 million, $100 million in the door through a loan, which we have no intention of paying back because there's no obligation to meet the, you know, to meet the debts of the company. The company owns the debts. I'm just the guy who's working here by virtue of my, putting myself on the board, but that's it. Right. And the way the law works that, you know, private equity company A that now owns Toys R Us. Toys R Us is the one bargaining. You can't reach the rest of us with that. So let's borrow the money. And instead of improving things so that we make enough money to both pay our employees, keep our buildings and pay back the loan, we just don't. We just take the loan money and we break it up into bits. However many people on the board voted in favor of this and you take whatever portion of that money there is divided by however many people are in on the deal and walk away. Won't the company go under? Yeah, the company will go under, but so what? Not private equity company A. That's who you really work for. Sure, you're a board member of Toys R Us, but who cares about them? We were always here to loot it. And by the way, if we can, uh, slash the prices on all the toys. Uh, also slash payroll at every store so we don't have to leak money along the way and uh, sell off whatever you got in a fire sale and then we'll divide that money up and keep it ourselves. What about the people who sweated actually packing up those boxes full of toys, shipping them to each Toys R Us outlet, unpacking them, shelving them, selling them, dealing with irate parents, whatever it might be, cleaning up uh, vomit on aisle six, whatever. Screw them. Don't pay them. Let them sue us. We have better lawyers than they do. Keep that money. 
give it away to the private equity guys and let them go to the Hamptons with it. And while these people lose their insurance, lose their homes, and by the way, will buy their homes at cut rate prices by the same for the, with the same private equity money and force them out afterwards and then tear it down and buy another uh, buy the lot and build another big box store that we're going to bust out later. Uh, all of which is taxed at a lower rate than the people you're taxing who are cleaning up the vomit on aisle six. It's really not very good. And it's really not nice to find yourself on the side of giving that preferential tax treatment. But here we are. Just thought I might make that clear if you don't remember it from the old days. All right. In a total shift to something else I wanted to share with you after having shared uh, the news from out of Kansas and you know, for all the good uh, that comes of it, uh, I wanted to remind you of something else going on in Kansas. Thomas Witt tweeted this the other day, and I kept it. Who is Thomas Witt? I don't know. He's a guy. It's just his personal Twitter. It says here in the Twitter bio, tweets and opinions are mine and mine alone, and do not reflect the reviews of any organization or candidate campaign. Doesn't tell me much about who he is, except that I think he's right to point this out, and this is the news. So, as you know, uh, Kansas voters came out and protected language in the current Kansas Constitution, which the Kansas Supreme Court has interpreted as protecting the right to abortion in the state. The anti abortion forces asked voters to remove that language that the court used to uphold the right to abortion and to privacy in general. And now you should be reminded this is not over. Six of Kansas's seven Supreme Court justices will be on the ballot on November 8th. So maybe that's the reason that they structured it this way too, right? We'll have the referendum in the primary and if it goes wrong, we'll be able to try to threaten the jobs of all the justices who we were whose work we were targeting with this referendum in the first place. 6 of Kansas's 7 Supreme Court justices will be on the ballot for retention as they call it on November 8th and that'll be explained in this thread. Who are they? Daniel Biles, Chief Justice Marla Luckert, Evelyn Z. Wilson, Caleb Stegall, Kenyon Wall, and Melissa Standridge, all up for retention, as they call it, on November 8th. Of the six, five of them voted to uphold a woman's right to bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom. It was this decision that the VTB amendment was meant to overturn. Retention, by the way, means this. Voters will decide if the justices will keep their seats on the Kansas Supreme Court. That's kind of how it works. If their retention votes fail, at that point, the governor, whoever that might be next year, will get to appoint their replacements. Hmm, that's interesting. Now, my thoughts on what to expect, he says, the radical right will, out of spite, target the five justices, the exception being Stiegel, who uh, it was the lone... Sam Brownback appointment among them and target the rest of them for defeat on November 8th, clearing the way for what they hope will be a governor, Derek Schmidt, to appoint their replacements. So, yes, it's entirely possible that if Republicans come out and win the gubernatorial race and replace the current governor with a Republican and can get people out to vote angry about retention or maybe rely on lower numbers of votes cast in a midterm election and, of course, on a down-ballot race to uh, come out on top there and defeat the retention uh, initiative for these uh, justices that they want to punish. They can kick out the vast majority of the court and all the members of the majority who voted to protect abortion rights and to rule that the Constitution protected them when it might not be explicit, and replace them instead with justices who might, say, promise them and the governor that they'll just see things the opposite way. Uh, Same words are in the Constitution here, but I I just don't interpret it as protecting abortion rights after all. And guess what? 
once they do that, it's actually kind of all over. We were talking about that with Greg the other day, that they might go the, what, I, what we thought was the longer route to try to replace members of the Republican or of the uh, Kansas Supreme Court with people who would just rule the opposite for whatever reason, whether they really believed it or not wouldn't matter. But that seemed like it would take too long. So they were going with the amendment route in, or the referendum route instead. That, of course, having failed, they could take the long road. But as it turns out, the long road is, might not be all that long. So that's their hope. Uh, Thomas says, my thoughts on what to expect, the radical right will, out of spite, target the five justices, and if they succeed, and also succeed in uh, electing a Republican governor, they could overturn things right away. In addition to helping reelect Governor Laura Kelly and send enough Democrats to the Kansas legislature to sustain her vetoes, we must work to save our Kansas Supreme Court. The last time the fascists tried to unseat sitting justices, was in 2014 when the two justices targeted, Eric Rosen and Lee Johnson, survived with narrow 52.7 and 52.6% margins, respectively. Don't let them win. If the fascists succeed in removing our justices, they will remake the court in their own image. Everything we accomplished yesterday, meaning the uh, on the vote on the referendum on Tuesday, will be lost. Keep your eye on these races. Contribute what you can to their retention campaigns. Be sure to vote yes on retention. And tell five of your friends to vote yes as well. Hell, tell ten of your friends. And if you don't have ten friends, go make some new ones. <laughs> it's a good advice. The Kansas Supreme Court is what stands between us and absolute tyranny from far-right, anti-woman, anti-LGBTQ fascists. Remember this in November. Save our courts. Right? Just like we keep telling people at national elections, the Supreme Court is on the ballot. In this case, it actually literally is on the ballot in Kansas. And immediately after this spectacular failure on the part of the neo-fascists and anti-abortion forces that were just dealt this tremendous blow. And before we move on and try to deal that blow to them in other states and nationally, there's going to be an opportunity for them to undo that victory don't forget that there's still work to do and still votes to be cast and uh, nothing rests where it is. These guys, remember, they'll take any opportunity, even if it is a long road, they'll take it. They apparently see no downside in doing that. And I haven't been able to demonstrate that downside for them yet. They'll just, they're willing to go the route of who cares what the law says. If it says the wrong thing, We'll just get people who say it says the right thing. And that's still in the offing. So I wanted to remind everybody of that going into the weekend, even if you're not in Kansas. Uh, and let's see, room for one more story. There are many contenders. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can squeeze it in, in two different quick stories, just to because I don't know which one you can do without at this point. One political, one, let's say, geopolitical. The one right here at home from Yahoo News. Uh, Michael Isikoff writing this piece for them, the chief investigative correspondent, of course, you remember his name. Exclusive, this is exclusive, Trump allies launch effort to recall Fulton County DA Fannie Willis. I told you just a second ago about... Uh, well, if it if if the Supreme Court votes against us, we'll just vote to replace the Supreme Court. Well, if the Fulton County, Georgia DA is going to go ahead with prosecuting Donald Trump, we're going to make an effort to get rid of that Fulton County DA. Donald Trump's allies in Georgia are mounting a campaign to recall Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis over her investigation into then president the then president's attempts to overturn the results of the 2020 election and are seeking to recruit high dollar donors to fund it according to sources familiar with the effort the private equity people will do it, apparently. The organizers of the campaign concede that the obstacles to a successful recall in Georgia are high, making the chances of getting a recall vote on the ballot before Willis makes her decision on whether to indict Trump is remote at best. But a source involved in the effort told Yahoo News that the aim is to use the recall campaign as a way to politically damage the Democratic district attorney, portraying her as a partisan actor who is ignoring soaring crime rates in Atlanta, 
if that's even the case, in order to get to target high-profile Republicans. A side benefit of their game plan, another source familiar with the campaign said, is to potentially influence a jury pool down the road should a case against Trump go to trial. The purpose is to politicize it, said one high-ranking Georgia Republican involved in the recall effort, who asked not to be publicly identified. The message here is, okay, you, Willis, want to play this political game? Well, we'll make it about politics. Well, it always was. That source, who's helping to raise money for the effort, said Trump and his associates at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Florida are aware of the recall campaign and that among those actively involved in the effort are David Schaefer, Schaefer, I don't know, S-H-A-F-E-R, the Georgia Republican Party chair, and Brad Carver, a prominent GOP lawyer in the state. Both men are among the 16 so-called fake electors in Georgia. How do you like that? Who recently received target letters from Willis informing them that they are potentially facing indictments in her probe. So no wonder they want to fund it. It's not just defend Donald Trump, it's save our own neck. How do you like that? So I wanted to make you aware of that, although we probably don't have much time to read all the rest of it. But rest assured, of course, that uh, murdery trader Green has involved herself in this. The recall campaign burst into public view this week when murdery trader Green retweeted a recall message from Bill White, a pro-Trump activist from Buckhead, the wealthy, predominantly white section of Atlanta, The Fulton County DA is using Fulton County taxpayers' money for her personal political witch hunt against President Trump, but will not prosecute crime plaguing Atlanta. Atlanta has worse crime than Chicago. Recall, wrote Murdery Traitor. And uh, you get a sense of how things are lining up here. Uh, Just wanted you to be aware of that. There's another thing that I wanted you to be aware of that's uh, horrible and worrisome and is not happening in this country. But uh, might as well. It seems like the sort of thing you might want to know. Uh, well, no, you wouldn't want to know this prior to a Friday, but too bad because that's the way we are. We wring our hands about things. AP reporting, thanks to Edith Lederer, the word from the UN nuclear chief. Ukraine nuclear plant is, quote, out of control. Oh, no, and it's not even Chernobyl. The UN nuclear chief warned that Europe's largest nuclear power reactor, and it's in Ukraine, isn't that great, is completely out of control and issued an urgent plea to Russia and Ukraine to quickly allow experts to visit the sprawling complex in the middle of a war zone to stabilize the situation and avoid a nuclear accident. Rafael Grossi, director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, said in an interview Tuesday with the Associated Press that the situation is getting more perilous every day at the, oh goodness, Zaporizhzhia, Zaporizhzhia? maybe, plant in the southeastern city of Enerhodar. I have no idea how you would pronounce it. E-N-E-R-H-O-D-A-R. Hodor, almost, like Hodar. Enerhodar. Maybe you pronounce it. Where Russian troops recently seized, uh, or which they seized in early March, soon after their February 24th invasion of Ukraine. Every principle of nuclear safety has been violated at the plant, he said. What is at stake is extremely serious and extremely grave and dangerous. But imagine how this sets up. You'll see in this article. Grossi cited many violations in plant safety, adding that it is in a place where active war is ongoing near Russian-controlled territory. The physical integrity of the plant hasn't been respected, he said, citing shelling at the beginning of the war when it was taken over and continuing information from Ukraine and Russia accusing each other of attacks at the plant, there is a paradoxical situation, this is the real trouble, in which the plant is controlled by Russia, but its Ukrainian staff continues to run the nuclear operations just because, oh my God, what would happen if you handed it over to Russians in general, whether they were qualified to run the place or not? right? Leading to inevitable moments of friction and alleged violence, he said. While the IAEA has some contacts with staff, they are faulty and patchy, he said. Grossi said the supply chain of equipment and spare spare parts has been interrupted, so we are not sure the plant is getting all it needs. The IAEA also needs to perform very important inspections to ensure that nuclear material is being safeguarded. And there is a lot of nuclear material there to be inspected, he said. 
When you put this together, you have a catalog of things that should never be happening in any nuclear facility. And this is why I've been insisting from day one that we have to be able to go there and perform this safety and security evaluation to do the repairs and to assist as we already did in Chernobyl. The Russian capture of this plant renewed fears that the largest of Ukraine's 15 nuclear reactors could be damaged, setting off another emergency like Chernobyl, the world's worst nuclear disaster, which happened about 110 kilometers or 65 miles north of the capital of Kiev. Russian forces occupied the heavily contaminated site at, at Chernobyl. Yes, we read about that earlier. Oh, I'm way behind on the music. Sorry about that. Got it carried away with this. But Russian forces occupied that heavily contaminated site soon after the invasion, but handed control back to the Ukrainians at the end of March. That's a wise move. Grossi visited Chernobyl on April 27th and tweeted that the level of safety was like a red light blinking. But he said Tuesday that the IAEA set up an, in, an assistance mission at Chernobyl at that time and that has been very, very successful so far. The IAEA needs to go to this other plant, which I can't pronounce nearly as well as Chernobyl, to ascertain the facts of what's actually happening there, to carry out repairs and inspections, and prevent a nuclear accident from happening. He and his team need protection to get to the plant and the urgent cooperation of Russia and Ukraine. Each side wants this international mission to go from different sites, which is understandable in light of a territorial integrity and political considerations, but there's something more urgent, and that is getting that team to the plant. The IAEA, by its presence, will be a deterrent to any act of violence against this nuclear power plant, I hope. So I'm pleading as an international civil servant at the head of an international organization, I'm pleading to both sides uh -oh, to let this mission proceed. Well, I hope it can. There's a little bit more to the article. I invite you to read it as I invite you to read all of these things. And even more to the point, and even better, I invite you to stick around here at Netroots Radio because the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes From up next. NetrootsRadio.com You have been listening to Kegro in the morning with Waldman. Yes, Justice will bring you all the news from around the country and around the world, including this other Eastern European-related piece of news, that at CPAC, Viktor Orban speaking again in front of the uh, conservative American crowds. CPAC is thirsty for Hungary's no-mixed-marriages Orban. Isn't that great? Stay tuned for more.